Good afternoon, everybody. We are having a English conversation, but I'm going to spend a few words in Italian. We're going to have this talk today based on Julie Meretu and Friends, Desita Dean, Jessica Rankin, Robin Costi Lewis. And I would like to welcome Caroline Bourgeois, who curated the show, as well as Patricia Figuer, who wrote an extraordinary essay that is included in the catalogue of the show. This is a quite a unique opportunity when we have so many top artists, and I'm sure that her convers their conversation with the curator is going to be most fascinating. This is quite an extraordinary show because it is not just a solo show, it is not a collective show either. It is something pretty unique. I don't know whether you have already seen it. Have you? Should you not have seen it? I would strongly recommend you see it. Enjoy the evening. To everyone, just thank you to be there. Thanks to all. And uh, I asked and proposed to Patricia to be the person with the question because all of us are so much into the show that myself could not take any distance. It's been very passionate and I'm super proud of what we did together. Uh, so so thanks to everyone. And uh, welcome Patricia, who was who wrote a superb essay on Julie's work and uh, discover everything when she came. Caroline, thank you very much for, to you, because this show was really amazing, and I discovered it after having written on Julie's work. And my first question will be about the title, because when I, I was this morning at the Rezonico Palace, and I saw a beautiful show on etchings, and on the other side of the canal, I saw Julie Meritu Ensemble, Grassi, and it was... I, I, all of a sudden, I, I, I was thinking of Chicago Art Ensemble, something like that. So I wanted to know when, in the process of organizing this exhibition, the titles were chosen. When did you select the title? How? Choke. I start, sorry. So we were thinking of making a, a title for the show. When it's monographic, it's usually just the name of the artist, as it is not monograph I mean, not exactly monographic. And then I speak to Judy and I said, the only title I have in my mind is Together. And then she said, let me think. And you can continue. <laughs> and I thought, Together... I didn't really, it wasn't until I translated it back to French that I was like, oh, that's what she means, ensemble. And then it made sense, it made sense in a really different way. Um, and of course, it made sense because it was like the idea was thinking around that idea of like it, you have even the Chicago Art Ensemble, but you really have this um, this history of the of ensemble and this idea of the of what 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 an ensemble is, whether it's in a core, a choir, a core, like a a vocal ensemble, or whether it's you know something that's a dance ensemble, or whether it's a a, a court, you know a, a a jazz ensemble. You have these various ways of doing that, and so I love the way, the way that 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 word plays, and even in French it also means something similar. And so I think you were really coming to the word from that, but translating it, and in the translation, there really isn't a thing a, a word when you say together. It really means it it it, it feels more. It becomes something else. It doesn't. I know it's a noun, but it feels differently than that. You know, it feels more like a adjective or something. It like, doesn't have the same kind of thing as an ensemble does. So that so that became something that made that resonated. But before we get going, I just want to thank all of those in this ensemble, which includes one of our band who's sitting in the audience. <laughs> so just a shout out to Nairi Bagramian, who we miss with us up here, but is maintaining, is like the purveyor of the I'm from down there. <laughs> Thank you. And then also, um, also those that are not here, Huma Baba and Paul Pfeiffer, and then really lots of great, great, grateful thanks to the three of you for being up here and um, participating in the in, in the last you know few weeks of this, um, the last couple of years of this, but also 
thank you for the incredible tours we've had the last few days in the, in the surrounding areas and learning and studying so much together, which is also another idea of this show, is this idea of group study and group learning, and that, uh, that that's where really things, a different form of, um, you know, a sense of making and vision come from, is from that place of group study. And I think Fred Moten talks about this a lot in terms of the, the undercommons, and that here we are mining those undercommons and digging together. Uh, as a matter of fact, maybe the public, uh, when discovering the show, uh, very, very quickly understand that you are already working since a long time on certain occasions, in certain moments together, or you have many relationships through your, through your work together. Would we speak a little, for instance, Tacita, you did uh, more than 20, 10 years ago, more than 12 years of 13 years, the first film on Julie's working in 2011. And uh, then you, you have done a second film, mm -hmm. A Conversation of Artists with Julie <coughs> and another artist. Could we speak about it? I actually made the first diptych. Um, when was Mural? When was it? About 2009. So, uh, was it 2009 you were in Berlin or yeah, 2008? 2008, but you filmed it in 2009 because we finished it. Okay. So, um, Julie was in Berlin uh, with Jessica as well, and uh, she was undertaking this monumentally huge uh, work. And uh, we had we met before, but we were getting to know each other. And she had a studio um, in Berlin, and I just thought I have to document this somehow. It was just a very innocent documentation at that point, because I just didn't think it was just this woman and this. I thought, my God, this a woman has never made such a big work of art ever, probably. So I went there with my 16 mil camera, and it wasn't until. Uh, 2011, when I made a show about uh, American artists, that I cut it into an artwork, and I called it GDGDA, which in Amharic, Julie's going to say it. Gad Gada. Okay. Um, which is Amharic for mural, which was the title that um, Julie gave the large painting, which is in Goldman Sachs in New York to this day permanent installation. And then after that, the second film, which is 150 Years of Painting, is came a result of the fact that, I, because I know Julie's birthday, and I also knew the birthday of this other friend, mutual friend, called Lucita Hurtado, and I knew that they shared a birthday, and it suddenly occurred to me that Julie was going to be 50, and Lucita was going to be 100 on the same day, in 2020. So I got the idea, Lucita was a painter. I thought, I'm going to make a film called 150 Years of Painting. <laughs> Title came before the work. And um, then I asked Julie uh, Lucita to talk about being painters and, and you know, women. And in fact, both were immigrants to America and mothers. And it became this cyclical film, which, is called 100, which we filmed in January 2020. And... Uh, January the 3rd, yeah. And uh, um, fortunately, I made that decision to do it in the year rather than wait for the date because Lucita never made it. She never got to 100. She died in August 2020. And of course, the pandemic arrived and it would have never happened. So it was a blessed moment. Can we say that for all of you, including Neri, who is in the room, Berlin has been a very important place for you all. Maybe not for Robin, she will say if it is. A very important place for your artist conversation. Could we say so? Uh, the place of Berlin in your life. Jessica, you were in Berlin too. Hi. Yeah. Um, yeah, Berlin was was so significant for for me and for for Julie certainly. Julie, we went there because Julie was given a residency with the American Academy in Berlin, and we had a six months residency there. And our older child was one and a half at the time, and 
it was, uh, so I was sort of coming out of those intense throes of early parenting your first child and trying to figure out how to be an artist again. And I was having a really hard time trying to understand how to be a parent and be an artist in the context of New York City. And I felt that everyone around me who was being a parent was like really parenting. And, and like their children were you know, going to play groups and like sleeping through the night and all of the things that I wasn't achieving. And I also didn't know how to not be with my kid. And it, it was just hard. And I, I remember arriving in Berlin and there was this incredible community of artists that we met who were parents and had this beautiful flow in their life of being together. It was actually really a kind of a description of this exhibition in a way. I remember sitting in, in Matthew Hale and Tessita Dean's house and they, we were surrounded by artists. We were having a dinner party, people were drinking, the children were sitting on the couch watching a cartoon and playing and running. And there was, it, it felt like expansive and possible. And it, I knew that the next day I could get up and there'd be time to make art and there'd be time that I could take my kid to the Kita with Rufus. And it felt possible in a way that in the States I felt like the time and everything was constrained. So we fell so in love with our time there that we want to, to go back and we ended up going back so that Julie could work on the Deutsche Guggenheim Commission and also on the Goldman Sachs Commission. And during that time, again, like just it felt like we were given this gift of time and space and it always felt like there was more time and space to think and be together and have community and be people who were able to make and be parents. And it, 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 was, it was an incredible time, very rich. And it seems that Berlin was at I don't know if it's, it is still the case, but uh, Berlin was a place where artist conversation could take place much more than London or Paris or New York. Don't you feel so? Conversation between artists instead. Robert. Um, I don't know if I'm going to answer your question, but I am going to ask. I do want to say something. Maybe it does. Uh, at the time that these two went to Berlin and these two were in Berlin, uh, and still now, but especially then, there was a moment where a lot of American artists and artists of color were going to Berlin to work. It was a known thing. It was like, you know, a different kind of work is possible here. But also, no, I've never uh, worked in Berlin in that way, but also uh, it became apparent again to me in the last few days of us just spending time together, how many of us had parents, mostly fathers, in World War II and what an incredible role that has played in all of our biographies. Um, and so I just wanted to put that out there because uh, one day, a couple of days ago, it, it, I was very um, moved by the conversations that we all had together. And I think also in the show Ensemble, um, you know, war and violence is our characters you know, in all of our work in one way or the other. And so anyway, I just wanted to say that. So sure, Berlin plays this role in our generation for artists, but also the history of World War II is something that I think, uh, and war in general, is something I think that by which we're all haunted or is a central place in our work. It's so, such a pity Neri doesn't speak because it's some uh, Neri and- it's Not too late, Neri. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, because at least two of you are still living in Berlin, and you go very, and usually you go back to Berlin very often. I remember to have seen you there. And Jessica or Robin, too, are you still going back to, to Berlin? I, I return and visit frequently. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Julie and I go as a family with the children frequently as well. Yeah, I, lo I love Berlin, and I, I love the time that we can spend in Berlin. And part of it is because I think that you have this rigorous community of artists in Berlin, but you also have a rigorous community of artists in New York. The problem in New York is they don't, they're, 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 I don't know why, but time, I think Ber in Berlin, time operates differently, and I'm not trying to romanticize Berlin in any way, but something about just how much one can do there. And I think there's there's a kind of openness to the way time, it just feels like it slows down somehow. And maybe the 
buildings aren't so close together, so time can just move through the street a little differently. It's also less traffic. I think. Something, that, it, well, yeah, sometimes. I mean, and less but, pressure, maybe. Yeah, there's, but but there is this real kind of thing. children had a certain kind of freedom, and if you're a mother, there's a certain kind of space that child, like your children have to be okay, and you feel like your children can evolve and grow. And in Berlin, there was this complete f space that children can just occupy mm -hmm. right next to but adults doing adult things. And in the U.S., you have a very different structure for that, and it's not necessarily safe for young kids to be out by themselves in New York, depending on where you are. So a lot of things like that, if you're really immersed in that, there was a freedom in Berlin that just allowed a certain kind of opening when we had young, when we had a young child and and, ha and raising young children to be able to like play in a, in a way that is really different than they can in the states. A lot of people in the states send their children elsewhere or whatever. They have you know different kind of living. But so I think that's important for for mothers. And then I think as artists, like the freedom by which people would converse and par and participate and also be super critical. So I think you have a certain level of really intense intentional criticality and intentional. Um, community there that feels very different than a certain kind of um, rapid um, desire to, I don't know, somehow New York has, while, while being a very important art center, feels like it's also, uh, there's a certain level of kind of co commoditiness or commodification yeah. that happens there that, that doesn't feel so present in Berlin, even though it, it, I'm not trying to be naive about either place. Could we say that there is less market pressure in Berlin, and so you have much more space to exchange ideas and to have a conversation, a critical conversation? I must say, each time I went to Berlin, I, I saw you. I was really impressed by the intensity of your conversations about arts, about politics. And as a matter of fact, Robin, I remember Adrian Piper went to live in Berlin, for instance. and. The intensity of this uh, communication and this discussion, I never thought it in New York or in London or in Paris, I must say. It was quite, it is quite unique. It is still quite unique. There is another. Mm. <laughs> I just agree with you completely. <laughs> but it's not only about conversation. You happen to write on the work of one over. For instance, Julia, I discovered today, looking at a catalog of Mary, that you wrote a very beautiful text on Mary's work. And uh, so this is, uh, what is a part of this critical work in your work, in your own work, as an artist? You mean as a, to think critically or to think... You have, you have written on Nehru's work, for instance. Yeah. I think... Uh, and, and, and in this show, I, I tried to write something on, on, every, on all of us, or the, or the relationships, or the reasons for the relationships. But I guess, for me, it's writing about something is a way to think about, like when I have written about um, anything, it's a way to rethink or try to make sense in myself as to what I'm interested in and what is really happening and to like interrogate what is what is going on with the work and why I'm so drawn to it. Um, or one of the reasons we've had this long, these long relationships, Jessica and I grew up from our late 20s, like we met in our, in 29, we were 29, we grew up making next to one another. You're a very young artist before that, at least we were. And I felt like I was just starting to exhibit on a certain, in a certain level, and we started to really look at art together and study art and came up with that together. Same thing with Paul Pfeiffer. I met Paul, I think, even before I met Jess. And Robin and I met way before, even when I was in grad school. Robin was studying, um, she was in seminary school. So we were in very different work fields, but we met each other way back then and started a conversation then, and that continued through, and then paused, and then continued later. So there this, each person has these different histories in terms of those kind of that kind of um, conversation. But when you when you find your people or when they find you, there's a there's a connection, and we're not all like close necessarily. Everybody hasn't all known each other, and it's not. But there's been these. We've had this wonderful time together. But there's also been this evolution of friendship between each of these people for Huma and I as well for years. I mean, since 2003 or four, and we've been in conversation all those years since, and we're interested in certain things that we like to mine together. Tacita, writing takes a big place in your way of thinking and uh, working. Am I wrong? No, 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 you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> well. I mean, I've also written about Julie, actually. And, um, and Matthew's written about Julie, too. And um, 
No, but it's. But I was thinking about the whole nature of this exhibition and what it means, and we've been asked these questions about what does it mean. And the interesting thing about it is, um, it's it's once what the, initially. I mean, let me just say it's just an enormous privilege to be in this exhibition and um, and just to be part of this constellation of, of people uh, and it feels like a constellation because how you embed those histories are embedded in your own life and you know I met Paul through Julie but that was years and years ago obviously Jess at the same time and you know we started to go on holidays together now so I went on holiday with 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 Robin and Neri we know each other from Berlin and and it, and we met Huma in Berlin and there's all these connect and it just gets accumulated and accumulated and accumulated, accumulated. So so when you get to this exhibition, it's really rich in terms of associations, and they are manifest in the work of Julie in a way you, that surprises even mm. someone who knows her work very well, because of the way this exhibition has been um, installed. So suddenly you're taken aback by, oh my God, the connection between Huma, that Huma and that Julie work, and that Neri, and 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 particularly I have to say Jess. Jess's work in that, in relation to Julie's, and and actually that's that's what makes this exhibition kind of incredibly interesting, is everything that takes you by surprise. So, um, and that is to do with a sort of, I mean, she doesn't. I'm sitting next to her, so she doesn't like it. But anyway, this incredible warmth and generosity of spirit that Julie has that is slightly unusual, because artists are more solipsistic than generous. And you're quite exceptional in that way, slightly well. I know you don't want to hear it. I know you don't want to hear it. But it's part of what Ensemble is. Agreed? Agreed. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> God, it's like having to go backwards to the point. But there's so many good points going backwards. I want to address what you said about criticality. Uh, if it isn't obvious, Julie has a prodigious mind. She is an intellect that is strange <laughs> in its kind of vastness and her ability to think across so many mediums, genres. Uh, she's interested in everything in this profoundly deep way. And um, so my first genre love is poetry and what poetry is, is you take something like the world and try to put it in a sentence. And it's a very strange art form. <laughs> Looking at Julie's, your paintings, is like me watching Julie squeeze the universe onto the canvas. It's very bizarre. I don't know how you do it. I don't pretend to know, point one. But um, I've had the most interesting conversations about criticality with Julie Moretu, right? The painter. That, I mean, I can't tell you how many dumb painters I know. <laughs> Julie is like a genius critical thinker, too. Okay, point one. Point two, uh, I want to say, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It is, too, an honor for me. Uh, before the show opened, Paul Pfeiffer and I walked through the galleries uh, alone, and we went our separate ways, and then we said we would meet up. So Paul and I have known Julie, we've all known Julie, we've all known each other, some of us, I've not known some people as long, but when Paul and I met back at the front door to leave, we were both in tears. That makes no sense. I know the majority of the work in the show. So it doesn't make sense that I would, and Paul would too, I mean, you guys are like twins, twins. It doesn't make sense, but I agree, the point being, I, I agree with what Tacita said. It's like uh, all of these non-articulated crossroads intersections of our histories that are ineffable and private. Nothing I've ever said to anyone. I've never said to you guys how it feels to be with you two, with our children, and all the histories we have together. I'm gonna cry again. It's the second time I've almost cried today. Um, to have that in the air because of the work. The work together is stepping forth together in a way that really shakes me. 
It really shakes me, okay? And then point three, the black elephant in the room is thank you, Caroline, thank you, Palazzo Grazi, for putting so many women, so many queers, so many different diasporas together in the same building at the same time, just spinning all around. I just have to say thank you, thank you. I would like to add that we both discussed a lot. Uh, we started the project before COVID, uh, and uh, it was important to think it's before all the disaster we've been witnessing. <laughs> but we discussed the fact that to bring um, your questions, which is shared with all your artist friends, was the beginning, in a way. Uh, and we agreed on that. And it's also to show there's so many layers on your work, um, as well as on the different titles, which gives you idea how to get in, that it's also reflected in, your, in the different position of your friends to give different layers where it could come. And I think it's a great fight to be together uh, and might be the only answer to go of today's time to go beyond individualism. Uh, so that's for me very important. And I don't know if you're going to raise that question, but there's also the music in the, <laughs> in the whole uh, show and the uh, show as a music. Yeah. <coughs> Could you could you expect? Is, yeah, I maybe it may be the very first time I see a show with some music in the air, in the room. So we could speak about Jason Moran and the way you work with yeah. him. You have worked with him. Yeah, I mean we have worked together. Uh, we also have worked together, Robin and I, along with Jeffrey and VJI and Jeffrey Siegler, who are here um, for our performance tomorrow night for the Kavafi Project, um, Archive of Desire. I've worked with in with other musicians at different times. Even when we finished the painting mural in Berlin, um, yeah, we had an uh, there was an opera that was pr presented, kind of an uh, abstract opera where they where there were different singers in different parts of this enormous space that could play the space in a particular way. So it's been an interest, the idea of performance. But I'm, but I think a lot of that is about performative performative time and how music is a time-based media that holds a certain kind of attention and how to and how to how to find ways to bring that into painting because i really think these paintings require time mm -hmm. and it's a very different experience when you watch the film promises that was done with that with the album with um floating points Sha sam shepherd and Farrah sanders when you hear that and you're watching this painting from a become start really minuscule yeah. get get really large and then become small again in the context of the museum you really get this other idea of time-based dynamics, but also something that I was I was reading this just before we came because I wanted to try and brush up on some ideas. Um, so I just need to say that um, Vijay is also quoted in this major text, but there's this writer, Fumi Okiji, who wrote this book about storytelling and jazz work as retrospective collaboration. And she bases a lot of her idea, she talks about on Benjamin's, Walter Benjamin's um, essay, The Storyteller, Reflections on the Works of Nikolai Leskov. And what he's talking about in that is uh, how fundamentally, and what she builds on, but takes it into jazz, is this idea of telling a story mm -hmm. and the repeatedness of telling that story over time, that the, each story adds as a, a, a thin transparent layer on the previous story in its individuation that happens mm -hmm. in its retelling, but that Fundamentally, it's this collective, and she in, in this essay she talk, she really goes back through, thinking like rethinking the idea of the solo as the, the great soloist artist as being the kind of um, storytellers in jazz to the idea that you have this collective mm. and the ensemble that talk that that is that is collectively mining and articulating together, even in intergenerational artists where some have died and some are still alive. That all of these artists who perform different songs over and over and over, these are different um, manifestations of that. And and so when you think of them alongside one another, they are in a way they're. They are dissonant at times, and relation. You know, they and, and what's the word? That I'm looking for the opposite of dissonant. You know what I mean? Yeah, not harmonious musician. 
Consonant, thank you, and consonant. So you have the dissonant and consonant can happen in that, mm -hmm. but it happens over time, and that we're that we as visual artists are all playing with this history of the visual, the history of architecture, the history of poetry, the history of music, the history of. And so we're taking this language over time, and we and lay, and it and it's becoming it's something that we work from. It's a lot of the same thinking around the idea of the vi visual neologism mm -hmm. that we are inventing language from all of this history because we needed a new so the individual or the individuation is in there but it's 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 in the space of the of this collective and and of collective forms of making does i don't know if that answers the question but jessica i wanted to sort of add to that because i think i mean i think there is an important and and long history of of like a, a kind of a collective consciousness of artists and of artists like bringing each other in and looking at each other and supporting and promoting. And many years ago, Julie and I were part of a show curated by Andrea Geyer at Artist Space. And the title of the show was When Artists Say We. And it, it was a, you know, a beautiful concept. But I, I also think it's important in the context of, of Julie specifically to, to think about um, the history of Julie's family. And Julie, when I met her, from the very beginning had this kind of very generous sense of like, we will do these things together because we will be stronger when we do them together. Mm. And that grew, I mean, not, I mean, it comes from Julie, but it also comes very much from Julie's family. You know, they had to leave Ethiopia suddenly and in desperate circumstances. And when they landed in Michigan, they immediately grew community around them. They not just family that were back in Ethiopia or that had immigrated, but other Ethiopians. They started hosting, they, they formed an association to support each other. They started hosting communal gatherings at their homes and at different homes, and it became a way to strengthen. And I think that, you know, when, so I think that there's a part of that kind of collectivism is, is deeply embedded in your understanding of how to be in the world. Your parents set that example always. And that's, it's been something that for me has, has meant so much. It tallied with a lot of my experiences and resonated with my life and it made sense to me. But I don't, but, it, you, but it's true Tess, that you don't always see people behaving that way. Um, so I do want to kind of give some credit to this background of, from Ethiopia, but also as like sort of immigrant refugees and how do you like pull things together and how do you to get, all get back on your feet. But don't you think that art history uh, <clears throat> could be written in a very different way? Because art history has always been focused on the great white male artist, let's say, the truth. And so you are precisely in a very precise moment, for instance, in the first years of the 20th century, modern artists were together. Mm -hmm. And they were working in a great, uh, proximity, let's say, I don't know how to put it in English, and uh, in, in a complete conversation, being more modern was being with over moderns. And you needed that. Absolutely. And then the, the sort of the 70s feminist artist yeah, collectives exactly. yeah. who promoted and helped and sh showed each other that, you know, AI art gallery is still in existence in New York. But still, art history yeah. and the market are quite reluctant to accept this idea, what do, don't you think? Yeah, they, they promote the individual, for sure. Absolutely, and as did so much of original, like so much of this earlier writing around jazz and um, w and the kind of stars that were born out of that moment was like Miles Davis and Coltrane, and you know, and it, it and you know, not and not that, but there were this constant. You know negotiations between many of them constantly, and I think that's one of the things that. But also, Jessica, to your point, to what you were bringing up, I actually think that in many, many contexts, even though you just brought up the many that exist in Europe and the West, you have that form of community making that exists. Const that is part of not even make it's not even community making it's just the way that p people evolve and I and I really do think that that that's the case in in um, not in not just in the, in the, in other other places that I've lived but I think you see that 
in things like when you read Ninth Street Women and you read of, of these women that were coming up or, or, or black artists that were coming up alongside that work, they were never given a certain kind of credit because they weren't um, part of the kind of, they, they didn't have the power to have in the critical dialogue. They weren't interested in them, even if um, they were very close friends with those critics like Clement Greenberg and Frank Boley. No, no. As, and they have these correspondence and letters and they're right, talking about art history and they're talking about art criticism and yet Clement, Clement Greenberg never wrote or took Frank Boley seriously as an artist. I didn't know there was a correspondence. Oh yeah, there's correspondence and letters between them. Wow. They're, where they're talking about theory and they're talking about these ideas of abstraction and yet he never wrote about his work. He was... Quite violent. Yeah, quite violent about it. Yeah. So it's a really interesting intentional decision making process and systemic process that kept that kept and that wants the heroic individual in this other sense and in this other space. There is a figure which is seems to be very important. Since the first piece we see is a, a dress, a wedding dress by David Hammonds. And I think David Hammonds is the ghost in the palace in a way. We see it, him on the first level, on the second level. Uh, why him? There's a lot to say. Uh, I'm the white girl, but I still dare to speak a, a little bit about David Hammonds. <laughs> as a ghost, but he's the reference. And for, for me, the first black artists who could make it, starting from his, uh, what he has, from his neighborhood, what he has, the works in LA, as well as when he moved then to Harlem. And, um, and you made uh, different talks about David Hammonds. You own uh, David Hammonds. You made a fantastic talk. You were there too about the abstraction on uh, David Hammonds as a political gesture. Uh, and we had to share that and to um, put in dialogue uh, because it's one of the first black figure for younger people. I introduced David Hammond to so a young black in Paris called Paul Taburet, who never heard, thanks to the good school in France, about David Hammond. And he had a shock uh, because he was, like a lot of uh, other black artists I met, uh, more into music because it was the only way to identify, to, to, to find a, a positive way to be um, a black person as an identity. Uh, and for me, he made a huge revolution, <laughs> making the most poor, ugly or smelly, whatever, something which can be beautiful. He's an opener, uh, and there's some other people opener, but I, but really, uh, 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 he made a fantastic uh, change. Um, and it had to be in the show because uh, it's in your life, but that it's maybe you speak, you continue on that. Um, and it's, uh, that's why he was there since the beginning also. Robin, I know you want to say something. Because I, I, saw, I saw that mic go up. So I think you should speak I, first. And then. I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> um, I, didn't want to, oh, I, didn't, I didn't necessarily want to say anything about uh, David per se, but I was thinking about the earlier conversation about the individual and how at the party that night when people were saying how generous you were, and you were saying, actually, it's also selfish of me because I want to take this in and I'm inspired. But also, you said something, uh, I forget what the sentence was, but it was basically uh, interrogating the notion of the individual uh, and the myth of the individual, if I might be so bold. I was thinking about that when you were talking about Western art history and how, you know, painters didn't start signing their work. I mean, you're the, one of the most preeminent Renaissance scholars in the world. You know, I know, can you imagine? Um, I love it. Uh, but, you know, painter, what, in the Western art historical tradition, painters didn't start signing their work. There was no painter to, you know, until, I don't know, you'll know better, 1500? I can't remember. Anyway, 14, who knows? I don't know this, it's not my forte. Um, but I'm bringing this up to say that one of the things that I appreciate about your work, especially, and all of the people's work in the show, but also the histories that we bring to it, is that the individual, the notion of the individual as a kind of existential identity performance, all of that, isn't something that appears to be very important. 
right? And so for me, what you just said about Julie, like embracing the whole world into her universe, but also her work, your work, your work, your work, right? Um, the individual just isn't an assumed presence. And I think, it's, I think that has a lot to do with abstraction. And so that's my tie-in to Hammond's, right? And then I started thinking about, an, uh, I think that America <laughs> is a racial shock for anybody, for anyone. If you haven't lived in America, you have no idea what I'm talking about. You don't, just trust me. Okay, and for centuries, people come to the states, move to the states, and suddenly they're, they're like, oh my God, this place is even more effed up than we thought, right? And you just can't imagine, and it's very traumatizing, it's very destabilizing. And so I'm saying this because in addition to the Ethiopian immigration to Michigan and embracing and creating this community, you know, I love to sit with your parents because I love to talk to them about what was that like? You left this war, and then you came to this crazy, insane, completely dysfunctional, heinous country, where suddenly you weren't Ethiopian, you were the N-word, right? In Michigan, okay? That's no joke of a state. That I, I hate that state. That's no joke of a state. I love it, but it's also known for a lot of stuff, okay? And so this notion of the individual, I'm sorry I'm going all over the place, but this notion of the individual not being a um, assumed presence or even performance or gesture, for me, is everywhere present in your work and Hammond's work. And I don't think it's a coincidence because of this racial madness that we live in, in our country. And so the figure, right, and there's nothing wrong with figurative work, I'm not saying that, but there's a long history of black abstraction in the United States. And Julie gave, I mean, Julie's show at the Whitney was extraordinary, and in the middle of that, she had this, uh, I don't know, what did you call it, symposium, right? Black queer abstract, is that what it was? I don't remember. It was one of th that, th those three words in whatever order. And it was such an amazing homage to abstraction. And so there's something about those things together. Um, I'm sorry I'm all over the place, but trust me, there's a place where it meets, where the individual is interrogated. Abstraction is a way that you can do that. And, the individual, where, and where community moving together, surviving, is more or as important as anything else. Sorry. By the way, there's something very impressive uh, in, in Julie's work, but in all the show, is precisely the presence of abstract painting. I know that the, the, the opposition abstract figurative is stupid, is silly in a way, but still, I'm very impressed by the fact that you are all very attached to this notion. <clears throat> and the fact that abstraction um, gives you the possibility of embrace a lot of conceptual stuff, a lot of problems, of a lot of political issues in the same picture. It's very precise in your work uh, since a long time because it's both very uh, political, always very political, with the title giving some kind of supplementary layer of uh, insight about the problem, and then at the same time you never Come, come si direbbe lasciarsi si andare a dare delle figure you, you never um, you are never <laughs> non so come fare uh, it would be easier far easier to make figures to make uh, images and it's never about images it's about perception perceptions so i think we could speak now about your different uses of photography, which is really something impre impressive. And uh, maybe we could start with the idea that at a certain moment, you left the drawing and the architectural drawing in your work, and then you switched to, util to, to use as a substrate uh, images, uh, public images, political images, but were not allowed to see them, who are only allowed to perceive there is something ominous in the painting, mm. 
We don't see it, but we feel it. We perceive it. We don't see it. Can we speak about it a little, uh, somewhat? Because I think it's interesting to understand. And in Jessica too, there is this kind of refusal of the image. Can we speak about it? Yeah, I think. I mean, that's it's that there is this insistence on abstraction. I think that really mm. it, it goes through many layers of the work, um, and and. And at the same time, there's, uh, I think, the reason for that is that there, there, that I think the kinds of, the kinds of, like, I think all of the artists here are really concerned with how one experiences not just senses and, and feels, but, it, but, but, but really, but it is about that sensory feeling, that visceral experience one can have that's in the body, that's... Um, in, that, that, that deals with memory, that deals with uh, uh, what, where something takes you and how it moves you. And I think all the artists here, immer uh, it, you know, that, that even happens, even in filmmaking, that it has a, has a montage kind of abstract way of get, getting put, put cut together the way you do that, but that also is a visceral, like you have these experiences with Tacitus films, portraits and others, where you feel that in the way that, that it's put together and decisions that are made in terms of how it's filmed. And... I think you have the same thing in Robbins and and with Paul's pieces. They're they're they're, they are the most representational if in, of any in the show, but they have at the same time this layering and this kind of aspect of um, collision in terms of where an image and a word intersect and how that and there's this abstraction constantly. And I think it, the reason I think one of the reasons that that people that at least that I feel so drawn to that is the kind of the kind of freedom that there is in exploring. What's possible when you don't have when you're not doing something that's describable with language, and that language becomes a limit in a way, mm -hmm. and I think that's where representation has a limit to a degree, but not always. But it mm -hmm. can have a limit in that way, and I think um, trying to push beyond that and trying to invent something further than that allows for a different form of radicality in terms of invention, and I think mm -hmm. that's something that everyone is kind of mining for in a way. Jessica. Yeah, I, I I like the way you put that, and I, I also feel like um, one of the, the things that kind of ties together all the different artists in the show is that they're, it, the work is very expansive in the in in the best sense of that you are given a lot of room as as the person viewing it. You're given so much room to move around in the work that it doesn't feel there's no sort of closed sense of what you're looking at. Um, whether it's Julie's paintings or Tacitus' film or sitting with Robin's words and the images, like you, there's just so much space to make connections and follow paths. And it, that's, that's where um, all the invention of the work is, in a way, between you and the work. And so, it, you know, I, I, do, I do really love this sense of abstraction as being the thing that kind of ties it all together. Even as you said, if we're looking at like a carved leg of Paul's, there's enough space around that leg and there's enough strangeness in that its position on the wall and for us to, for it to really truly be an abstract thing. Um, and that to me, that's something that I am always kind of striving for. And so I do use words and language, but I, um, and I, I, read a lot of poetry and I'm very interested in the abstraction of poetry and the space it gives you. So it come, there's a, you'll find a perfect line, but it doesn't have a specific meaning that there's, there's so much space around it and within it. And so for me, that is one of the reasons I find poetry so endlessly fascinating is that in a way you, you engage with it and you study it, but you also kind of let it wash over you and see what happens. And so I, do bring language into my work, but it's always with that sense of that these words are kind of able to to move in different directions and say different things, um, and that they come together with an image to maybe make a new possibility. Uh, uh, by the way, I wanted to ask you which text was the basis for this uh, organza embroidery, with, yeah. uh, which is a, a text, but yeah. Impossible to read as a right. Roman inscription. Yeah, yeah. So, what is this? Is a text? That's an. Uh, that's probably one of the earliest pieces that I made. That's in the show. And um, uh, in my earliest work, I was really just working with text, but I liked the idea that the text um, behave calligraphically in the sense that it it was the sort of 
it embodied meaning rather than that it you know was legible with meaning. Um, so in this case, it kind of both was, but it but it really comes in and out of focus, and you'll find a word and then you lose it. Um, the text itself is a collection of writings I did um, from my early 30s. It involved um, like diary entries from a drive that we took across Australia. It involved comments that my ch my first child had made when they were little, things I overheard in the street, song lyrics. So everything kind of gets woven in together. Also lines of poetry from my mother's poetry, who was a, my mother was a poet. So in a way, like all the things come together and it becomes a kind of a concrete poem in the sense that you move in and out of it, you pick certain words together or separate. And, and so they, again, the meanings multiply and expand. I was interested by the importance of poetry in, in the whole mm. of uh, the show. Robin, could we speak about your work, present sure. the slideshow, which is one of the big moments of the show? Sure, I'd love to. Um, I want to start with saying it's so amazing to be with other artist friends for whom poetry is so central. Everyone here, that is true, for whom that is true. I mean, and Nairi's sculpture is like these crazy poems to me. Um, the piece that's in the show is a piece I wrote for Julie. Um, and if you get the magnificent book, which I finally read this morning, you'll hear more about why. But um, we were going to do this project, and I hope we still do. If you haven't seen Julie's monotypes, have a look. And I knew nothing about monotypes, really. I didn't know about the how you make them. And when I researched how you make them for this project we were doing together, I, I the monotypes that Julie did, did, the first thing I said to you is like, they're so intimate. She's so, I mean, you're, she's just right there. And it blew my mind. And then the history of monotypes is that, for those of you guys who don't know, forgive me, I didn't know anything about it, is you only get one chance. You, like, you make this image, you carve this image, and then you print it. And maybe you can get another one that they call, appropriately, a ghost. <laughs> there are a lot of ghosts in this show. Um, but that fascinated me. And what I thought was, I want... And so we were going to do this project, this book, I don't know, this ex exhibition... Uh, of monotype, Julie's monotypes in my words. And so I was really, at first, trying to make English behave monotypically. Like, how do you create a sentence that is like her monotypes, right? How do you do that? And, and also, at the same time, because it's a collaboration, give her something to work with. I mean, you don't want to mess around and give Julie Maria two roses or red, violets or blue, right? You got to give her something. I felt like that. The great curator Christine Kim says, N don't walk in a room with your hands empty, you know? And I love that, and she means metaphorically. So I was really trying to give Julie something to do. Um, yeah, so that's where the abstraction. So my piece uh, is... Uh, a video installation, single channel, of antique photographs that I discovered under my grandmother's bed, and it traffics in nostalgia deeply. Like, if you didn't see, if you didn't hear the words, you would just be like, these are really, and they're photographs, but they're still interesting, because they're a private archive, right? Um, but what I was trying to do was have the nostalgia lure you in and then cut you to pieces with abstraction. Seriously, like in language because I wanted the language to be a monotype that made you go, and you know, you, I go to the photographs, ah, oh, that's a gorgeous photograph. Wow, look at those people. Look at how they pose for photographs. Look, and then the language goes, you know? No, not at all, right? Time isn't real, history is not real, the individual isn't real, start over. And that's what the monotype um, I learned from studying Julie's monotypes and monotypes in general. And so it actually was a great gift to be uh, invited into this project before this exhibit. This is during quarantine because I had been struggling. I was so bored with how we are expected to write poetry. I was just so bored. Um, and it was this amazing moment that I've not turned, I've not gone back, you know around experimenting with language as an abstraction, not visual, but um, 
Yeah, ideological, philosophical, like there's just a page that just says yes and nothing else. You know, and to, you know, we talk about decolonization a lot. For in the West, when you are in a capitalist situation, to create something <laughs> that is one word only for a woman artist, that takes about 50 years of therapy to get there, <laughs> right? Because of course you're supposed to fill up the page and talk all the time and be pretty and be cute, cross your legs, blah, 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 la, 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 sha, 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 right? Do you want a cocktail? Can I entertain you? And to learn how to stop doing that takes a long time. Julie's work inspired me so deeply, so deeply, that it made me take English and go, okay, all bets are off, what can I do? So that when she sees this line, she will also have an image arise in her that isn't in prison. <laughs> that. Sorry, I'm so verbose, obviously. Um, I just want to say one more thing about that, uh, is that to be invited into the circle, period, with these people, it's such a profound homecoming. And to be invited to work with you, um, I'm going to cry. You know, Julie and I have known each other a long time. I went to her first graduates show oh at RISD. And I remember the canvases, right? And then we weren't really friends. We'd bump into each other. We'd talk about girls, <laughs> talk about life, you know? We were friends, and we have dear friends in common, but we weren't like we are now. And um, there's a line in the piece that I wrote for her. It's like, you know when we met, there was something in me that people, an inkling of sensation in our friendship that people would later call the future. And it, it feels like time, our time together needed to wait until now, you know? And then I could actually say something to her that was of value. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. It's like mine, it's life changing what happened to my own work because of our friendship. Well, maybe there is something very precisely common in all your work. It's the sense of, um, I don't know how to put it in English, l'incommensurabilité, the immeasurability of time. Robin, in your, in your video installation, there is a moment where you speak of billions of years. There is a very beautiful and very mom moving moments, billions of years and so on. And I think in all your work, there's this sense of a very peculiar temporality, which is out of reach of human minds. Could we speak about it? Is it a generational fact? Is it linked to what we are going, well, well starting to live together now? Could we, could we explain a little? It's interesting, because I really thought about that line when I was looking at Pierre's newest film in the show at um, Liminal, um, in Punta de la Dogana, where you have this human skeleton and the mirror that's looking at the entire cosmos and yeah. putting that in context. And just recently there was an article in the, in the Times about losing touch with Voyager, that spacecraft, that's out at the limits of the universe right now. And that they're trying to re reconnect with that. And my family was in having a family chat about that. And um, my brother texted this really interesting fact that the amount of time it would take Voyager to get to the nearest star that could maybe be closest to this kind of star that could possibly have a planet like this would take 44 million that I don't remember a lot of years <laughs> <laughs> 44 whatever the number is but like yeah. 44,000 44 million whatever it would take but that um, that's the amount of time that it took human beings if we've understood things correctly t to move through into the whole planet from as from um, East Africa as its source. So that's a huge amount of time, that scale of time. And to think about just that fact and how fundamentally alone we are in this, yeah. at that scale, is something that I think all of us are dealing with in the daily 
you know, violence and joy and realities that we have to experience and negotiate. And it's one of the kind of existential questions that 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 keep us pursuing this act, act, activity for as long as we live. And it and 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 part, that is the insistence on living, the insistence on being here, the insistence on creativity and invention, despite all these all the all these odds. And that's it. Up. What do you think about it? Um, is it present in your reflection as an artist too? No. You, just what you said reminded me of something that the son of Donald Crowhurst wrote for me in a book years and years ago about Donald Crowhurst who disappeared at sea. He said something like, you know, if you think about the enormity of time, you know, you get lost in a way, so you have to just deal, look at the detail. And, you know, because it can just be overwhelming. I mean, it's just overwhelming. Yeah. Mm. And, um, you know, of course I work, I mean, time is my biggest, yeah. you know, thing I use the most actually. And interests me the most, and you know Pierre's show, of course, is all about sort of. I mean, he is um, an extraordinary artist in the way that he's dealing with time that is, in a way that I haven't actually seen anyone else do because it's he deals with it as a sort of terrifying thing, um, and and so. But with me, I'm, I mean, for me, I, it's just much more local. <laughs> it's like, you know, obviously, uh, 50 years between you and Lucita, and it's about 24 frames a second, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, but, you know, yes, of course, time is, is profoundly important. In, in, and, and this exhibition, I have to say, is a lot about... Um, I mean, there's so, so much about the palimpsest in what, how Julie makes her paintings. You know, you talk about the history of the undercoat and the... Totally strata and then you know and suddenly this sort of is that a figure N no it's gone <laughs> is that an eye is that a breast is that a cunt is that a whatever and it's gone and it's elusive but it's all in that sort of history of that painting and there's one painting where they're just the surface is no longer there and you really see deep time no. in the corner of one of your paintings you see that and it kind of you know whoa and that's that bit is it you know him that and Pierre those two you know him and you are just like that is the you know the far reaches of time as it's possible to for artists or anybody to capture it in in a in a, any sort of medium really so uh, and that is yeah and that's all in our histories and the history of friendship and the history of you know the cycle and the spiral of you know going back in each other's lives and you know and your friendship becomes my friendship and I'm becoming friends with them and they've become friends with them and it's and that's what's this manifest in the work and in this exhibition and so it is about time definitely and we all work with time you know and time is you know what you have in the day and that's what you you know, there's nothing nicer than turning a day into a work of art. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can, can we speak about this as the second level of the exhibition, the upper, the attic, I don't know if you, we can put it, on this last series of painting we are seeing, which has translucid, and Neri uh, made a special kind of display for this painting. Can we speak about it because it's a, I think it's a turning point in your work and it's precisely related to this question of something ominous is there we don't know what it is but we feel its presence so it's always about time too can we speak about this series yeah it, it's interesting like today we were in the galleries I was there with Ari and we were walking around looking at some of the paintings and um, the big room downstairs with Neri and I, with the large paintings and the sculptures, um, there was the way that the light was coming into the room. Um, anyone who was walking around, their shadows yeah. were were part of the wall and part of the painting, and was constantly changing the painting. And that's the reason I started even thinking around working with trans yeah. trans paintings. Was I was working on these black and white blurs, and the way the they felt like the blurred photo becomes just this series of shadows and lights. And 
and this amorphous kind of space. And when you're sta- and when when we, when at least for me, when I would look at them, my shadow would interact. And and it, there were moments where I, even when I was painting them, where I'd be like, "Is that my shadow? Or is that in the in the painting? Is that?" And and I became really interested in how that changed from which perspective I was looking at it, and how the blur emerged, and what happened to the marks with the blur, and then with the body and the shadow with the blur, and this this kind of social activation of the paintings. And that's where I started to think about the trans paintings. What happened? if you can actually have that experience. And then, um, you know, thinking about the display a lot, Myra and I were talking about this for a long time because for me, it came with this, you know, this idea of where you could see both sides and Lena Bobardi was who I, who I was thinking about as like the most kind of obvious kind of mm. call for that. And... Um, and in our conversations, what's really interesting, it was after I saw Nairi's show at the Nasher, I was on my way home from that. I had to do a talk in Baltimore, no, no, in um, D.C. And I um, went to see the, her, what's, it, what's the name of that collection with the paint? Yeah, the Barnes, the Barnes, yeah, Philadelphia, not Baltimore, in Philadelphia. And I went to the Barnes Foundation. Oh, yeah. Everybody tells you how phenomenal this collection of paintings is. But no one really talks about, at least not to, I haven't re- heard, that it's, it's really, what was kind of remarkable is the display yeah. and the intentional kind of constant, you know, room after room after room. It's like these walls are, have an altar-like structure to them, except all of the elements that, that are the, the sculptural elements that compose this are um, uh, steel or iron works tools made by steel or iron and most of them have very kind of sharp ends or their or their or their keys or their you know tools that you use to do kind of you know break something or lift something or pinch something or wrench something or poke something or screw something so they 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 their tools they they look almost like they're set up in a way that's creating some form of torture on most of the nude paintings or nude bodies in these paintings and it made me, it resonated so much with me with the Nairi show, and I was so moved by that experience. And as I was walking out, out of the Barnes Foundation, I just thought, Nairi, like, I should ask Nairi to, talk, to do these, to do these, because it was what, what she was doing in the sculptures and how she even put these sculptures in conversation with the other works that were at the Nasher in these dialogues with these other mm-hmm. sculptures there. That dialogue was, there was so much there was so much social kind of criticism that occurred in that or or interplay and i was really moved by that and i think what's what what's really interesting is i don't know i keep saying i don't know how you did it where nairi f- put together this form of display came we had some visits we talked but she came up with this structural way of doing this that holds the paintings that forces them to stand and be something that confronts you that gives them their beingness that gives them some kind of animatronic feeling like they uh, anthropomorphizes them that they are then standing on two legs of course structurally supported somehow or another crutched held clamped presented stretched tightened like these are words that are somewhat torturous somewhat um so you have these two elements happening at the same time and yet there's this, there's this, they almost feel like they could start moving or, or doing something mm-hmm. in a particular way. And so it's that dialogue, this is that, it's that, it's, it's, it's um, like a duet in that way. There's this, and there are these two, and then there's the ghosts in the paintings and the, and the people moving in and out of the paintings. All of that contributes to the experience, which are very mutable experiences of these paintings. I must say that this series is particularly impressive with the light of Venice. Because it works perfectly, of course. It needs this kind of light to work absolutely. But uh, since Neri is not with us, it's quite difficult to speak about it. But <laughs> uh, but I think the show is impressive too because there are, there's two aspects of Neri's work. I mean, there's this culture and there's, there's this kind of work which we don't know exactly what it is, but it is about sculpture or design or but it's not design, it's something else. How to name it? It's quite difficult. And the way she manages this kind of indeterminacy is fantastic, especially in the show, because so, so, uh, the two levels, at the two levels she has works, very different works, quite opposite works, but 
I won't speak about um, anymore because she doesn't want to speak. Come well, on. the one thing I will say is it, it's interesting, like the painting, the, the, the large paintings downstairs and the sculptural installations in those large paintings and I, in and in front and around and inhabiting that space, whether they are... They, you know, there's there's one painting that has a sculpture right in front of it, literally like right in front of it, and you feel like there there's these moments where it can like be an intr an intrusion on the painting, but then you then as you look at the sculpture, then there are these elements that come out of the sculpture from the painting that you see in this. So it's like I don't even know if you had seen that painting before. I don't think so. And there's this, there's this other than images of it, and there's this in interesting relationship between the flies, the clamped, the clamped kind of torturousness of these dangling sculptures that just touch the ground, almost don't touch the ground, but are just, you know, and, you, and, and the whole infrastructure of that, the, the armature that's holding that piece together feels like the lines and the coming out of the painting. And so to me, there was this, I mean, that's a really kind of a, amazing co conversation, but it's also this really kind of unexpected way of interacting with one yeah. thing and another, you yeah. know? And I think you see that. Um, so, th so that was one point, but then the other point being that, it feels like there's this syncopation between that floor and what happens again in a different reverberation or different Absolutely. time upstairs. Yeah, I, I, I'm not an Irie, but I would yeah. also like to talk about her sculptures because I did feel like those two rooms yeah. uh, had such a connection and yeah. they were, the, 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 the Nairi pieces on the first floor have this kind of body... This, you know, the central elements that have sort of a body and a skin texture and even have hair in the photographs. Um, and, then, and then they have this kind of disintegrated infrastructure around them. Mm. And then upstairs, your paintings become skin-like and there's a kind of a tautness to them, uh, unlike the kind of heavy body in the weighted ones downstairs. And then the, the sort of thin translucent skin has the has the solid infrastructure around it that feels like the sort of externalized like exos exoskeleton or something. So to me, like they actually really spoke to each other. I'm not sure if that's what Nairi was thinking, but it was. I found it a very interesting okay conversation. <laughs> cool, uh, Caroline, you wanted to say something when we were speaking of the. No, I was thinking. Um, uh, I was thinking of the because uh, Judy also collaborate with the uh, operas so uh, I had the chance to see the um, and we discussed at the time the the transparent painting to see the show uh, you did with um in the Tashan sorry uh, monochromatic light afterlife after the Rothko Chapel yes which was fantastic with some of the painting were printed and then they were the 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 singers and dancer all black it was revisited and uh, choreographed by Peter Sellers and there were all that question of transparency of ghosts but transparent and what I think is also fantastic uh, we spoke a lot about Neri during the whole the process of the show and met also but it's to to have a room which is dancing um, that the, uh, the the public became part of the works uh, that's incredible, and I think for you, Judy, to agree on the way we installed uh, with Nairi, with all of the guests, the idea was to be in dialogue, not to block them um, in one of the rooms, to have the Nairi's room, your room, the room. Well, you, you have to have your room because it's the work itself. <laughs> but, uh, um, so to engage the, um, yeah, the thing which can appear that we don't know, so, so the risk. And I think you always took risk anyway in your work, but there's a risk in the ma way of making the exhibition uh, happen. Yeah. I mean, what I was going to, when you talked about music, yes, I thought you were going to talk about the fact that the installation is so much about rhythm. Yeah. That's what I thought you were going to talk about. And then you went off to talk about music. Mm. And, um, but just, which is. <laughs> Which was, of course, a legitimate thing to go off and talk about. And that's what I'm saying. Is but I actually thought that the way I mean, you get this sense of beat, 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 beat. beat you know that that is really strong, mm -hmm. and the feel. You know, and of course that relates back to the title as well. Yeah, there's rhythm there. There's yeah. rhythm. Absolutely. 
But that's something we're both obsessed by. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we all. So the music. I, I was wondering to 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 to. to to get back to the title of the first David Hammond's piece, what are the forgotten, forgotten dreams here? Um, because I noticed all your titles, which are, there is a strong sense of melancholy or dramatic constatation or political insights and so on. And I was, I have a very naive question for you. And um, do you think you are still moderns? <laughs> I think that's an interesting question because I think that's it's the, a very that's one of the it's important. Yeah, and it's one of the questions that um, Lawrence and Paul and I grapple with in the in in the conversation for, that we did for um, around Denison Hill for October Magazine, and we reproduced in the catalog. And it's and I think it comes. One of the challenges for all of us is we are living in the kind of explicit um, realizations of the failures of modernity and the modern project, and we are experiencing those, and we, we, we've all experienced the failures of those promises. I mean, the promises of the civil rights movement, civil rights acts, and the civil rights movement project in the U.S., the... About post, uh, the a desire of a post-colonial kind of future, the promises of the post-colonial reality, po promises of fraternité, égalité, and whatever. What are they? The three? Fraternité. Yeah, and fraternity, égalité, and liberation. Brotherhood. Yeah, Bro yeah, exactly. And so, but I'm just saying, all of these promises that we would be. We're, we're seeing the failures of that. We're seeing the failure of the nation state project. We're seeing that dematerialize in front of our eyes, the failures, democracy, like we're seeing that. And so I think there's really this time where we're kind of, um, where one of the reasons we keep going, at least Paul and I in conversation, but many of us, this, this, this space of exodus is we're really dealing with this kind of moment of the aesthetics of uncertainty, in a way, and um, and and the requ the requirement for some kind of fulfillment. Those of us who've lived through revolution or desires of revolution have have watched that self consume itself and the fit and and what takes the place of that of that. And we're, but we're just seeing that on many levels. And I think at the same time, there's this rapid invention of of technology, and so. And that is, in a sense, following the model of neoliberal capitalism, which is as consuming us with a more ferocious speed than we even can understand. So I think we're in a moment of just complete, um, everything feels like vertiginous and and disorienting distressed. and distressed. And and that's and that's much of the kind of current you know, temporal, current social time that we're in. Yeah, yeah. And so it's hard, but that's a really interesting question. Like this idea of, are we still, like what is this set, the idea of modernity and how do we occupy that space? And, you know, that's one, one, of, the, one of the most interesting kind do, of, I think. Do questions. you think we could get rid of the ideal of emancipation? It was linked to modernity well i think emancip emancipation and liberation is still required but i but the question is maybe modernity wasn't the answer maybe i mean that was an effort you know who knows i mean i mean i don't know what what do you think about that i'm asking just <laughs> and i thank you all for, for for this conversation i think it's a really good thank question you. Thank you, thank you for this extraordinary show. Thank you to all. Thank you to Neri too. <laughs>